The other issue that you mentioned that I thought was interesting was the whole concept of leadership and the difficulty in terms of self-determination theory research, especially mm -hmm. being accepted by right. leadership and say, and more school and school district leaders saying, oh, this makes sense. We've never thought of organizing schools through this lens. Mm -hmm. And it makes so much sense to do that. Why hasn't that been able to happen? Becomes one critical question for right. uh, self-determination theory experts like Rich Ryan and John Marshall and all those guys and ladies out there who are focusing on it. You know, how do we do this? How do we get this into how do we change the mindsets of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the policy makers to see the importance of this in terms of student growth and development right right and the other thing that you mentioned which i thought was really interesting in terms of the dynamics of of control mm -hmm. and i know ryan and dc talked a great deal about this in terms of high stakes testing right. and other financial controls, class size, scheduling, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. how, how controlling that is and how it limits the creativity and the, the meeting of psychological needs of kids. Right. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Burr. Hello and welcome to Agentic Schools. I'm here with Dan Termasic. The way we overlap is self-determination theory itself, which is any you know, regular listeners know that that's something I pay attention to. And so, uh, Dan, I like to start with uh, storytelling because stories are really important. So tell me a story about either a school or maybe teachers, somebody who really took advantage of self-determination theory or what they did looked like it was certainly taking advantage of self-determination even if they didn't know that was what they were doing. That's an interesting question. I guess what I'll focus on is the, is the school, that uh, School Without Walls, by the way, in Rochester, mm, right. New York, uh, that I was the principal of for 23 years. I taught there for initial two years and then became principal. But it started in 1971 as a result of several teachers at a traditional high school who were interested in a lot of the stuff that was going on in terms of challenging traditional educational values. Mm -hmm. People like Sid Simon, Howie Kirschenbaum, of course John Dewey and others mm -hmm. were in the mix and uh, these people got together and uh, with a group of students and a group of parents and proposed to the school board. Uh, this was 1969, so it was mm. the age of everybody questioning everything, you know, everything from religion to schools. And that tended to work pretty well because the liberal board at that time, who had also passed a new policy for integrating the schools within mm, uh, right. racially integrating the schools. So you had a liberal board that said, yeah, that makes sense. We ought to have a, a school that ideally uh, and idealistically, I guess, uh, achieves the goals that you guys are after, having excited kids who come to mm -hmm. school because they want to be there and can pursue some of their interests and make decisions about the mm -hmm. school, that sounds like a reasonable kind of thing. So they passed it and gave the the teacher leader at that time, I think he was the English department head at that time, the same as mm -hmm. Lou Marx, the ability to recruit a staff of interested people and plan things out in terms of where and how we would, would recruit students or whatever. So 
At the same time, I was working with, I was a teacher at the junior high that had proposed the same thing. It's kind of interesting mm. that there are three kind of alternative, if you will, schools going on at that time. There was the World of Inquiry Elementary School in Rochester that uh, was the result of a federal government grant mm. and input. And they did some really good things. Interim Junior High, where I was at, was the result of a group of politically powerful parents and Kodak, the corporation mm. that pushed this. And mm -hmm. School Without Walls, interesting enough, was the result of teachers getting together and recruiting students and parents to be the motivators and the uh, implementers behind it. It's interesting that after uh, over 60 years now, since 1971, I think that's well over 50 years, <laughs> uh, that School Without Walls is the only school that has remained intact and maintained its philosophy and methodologies in terms of continuing. So. Yeah, yeah. So that was the beginning of School Without Walls, and they had a number of... It's interesting, again, that the things that they implemented, which replicated a good deal of the Dewey schools at that time mm. and beliefs of people like Simon Kirschenbaum, Herbert Cole, and Postman and Weingarten, those folks, that it implemented a number of those things, but they didn't call it uh, self-determination theory. Right, it right. was just things that made sense in terms of democracy and involvement of kids and, and in terms of intrinsic motivation, although they didn't call it intrinsic motivation. I think, right. they, I think the, the key words were more student ownership at that time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, and I can go on to explain some of the organizational aspects were that not only uh, implemented, but kind of maintained and self-developed uh, some principles of self-determination theory. Yeah, go ahead and jump into that, because not just an individual, like, okay, we're going to do autonomy support, but how does the organization ensure that, the, that, in fact, autonomy support is more like a cultural pattern rather than just one teacher deciding that they should do that? That's a good question. A lot of it was evolutionary in terms of what, you know, kind of, flying, uh, building the airplane while they were flying it, you know, in terms of what worked and what didn't. But it's interesting. Uh, I, I think to begin with, Lou Marx was a strong supporter of democratic decision making by the mm -hmm. staff. And uh, so that kind of reinforced the whole concept of, I think, not only empowerment of the staff, their autonomy from the rest of the district, which Mm. still is maintained a great deal in terms of, well, that's school without walls. You know, they kind of do their thing. You know, they, you know, they've got freedom in terms of curriculum, in terms of standards, in terms of assessment, mm. pedagogy, everything. You know, they do their own thing. So that was critical in terms of that group of staff that Lou recruited. And by the way, I applied in 1971 to be a, a teacher at that school, and I didn't make it. I didn't make the oh. cut. You know, I made the other one at the junior high, interim uh. junior high, but not, not school without walls. But anyway, so I think uh, staff selection was important. It was a yeah, critical that. aspect in terms of recruiting people who support the goals. I think in mm -hmm. terms of organizational health, I think that's critical to have people there that kind of buy into this philosophy and and direction that they're going in. One of the first things that they did, of course they didn't have a curriculum. They, they didn't they didn't have classes, they didn't have anything. They met in a warehouse and I think from what I I can recall visiting there once was that the principal's office, Lou's office had a big steel beam going through it and every time he stood up he hit his head on it so uh. i don't know whether or not that maybe was the slap on uh, slap upside the head that generated more <laughs> creativity or not but anyway that was unique in terms of the place that they met they had a yeah. picture of the school opening on the first day of uh, school and one teacher her name was val bond at that time val mcpherson now she met with her group of kids, about 12 kids, mm 
school was 175 kids that was selected oh, okay. by lottery. Mm -hmm. And they met around the hood of a car. <laughs> and they were, uh, it was interesting. Some of the kids were smoking, you know. I mean, there were all these issues, you know, in terms of what are we going to allow and not allow or whatever. But they, uh, and so these groups of kids who were kind of randomly assigned to these teachers talked about issues in terms of what excites you. You know, what mm -hmm. should we be offering classes in? What should we do? So <clears throat> I'm skipping over parts of it, but in general what happened, there was a bulletin board outside the office that had three by five cards on it with all kinds of classes that were going to be offered. If you're interested in learning about the Constitution, we're going to meet with this teacher at the law office of this hmm. downtown district attorney who's going to work with us, you know, and so there were all kinds of classes going on using the community, which was mm -hmm. beautiful in terms of learning to use the community as a resource to investigate and explore things. So, so they did a lot of that, but they found out that some kids weren't showing up. You know, mm -hmm. how, do, how do we hold kids accountable for coming to school and taking attendance? And, you know, are there some traditional aspects of traditional schools that we ought to be implementing? Was part of the question that they mm -hmm. were dealing with. And so they decided to have what they call extended classes in the morning. Mm. First thing in the morning was a two and a half hour block of an interdisciplinary class that met the needs of and the interests of kids. You know, so there were classes like criminal justice. There was mm -hmm. another one on business and marketing. There was another one on family relationships, you know, all things that, you know, were, you know, drugs and alcohol and sex, mm -hmm. you know, was another one. So they, you know, there were classes that really honed in on the uh, interests and the needs of kids and the needs of society as well. Mm. So those kids would meet for a two and a half hour block with that teacher and they would pretty much decide what to do mm -hmm. and how to do it and what the norms would be in that class in terms of behavior and expectations and are we allowed to smoke in here or not, you know, and mm -hmm. can we walk up, can we get up and go to the bathroom if we want without asking for permission? All those things were dealt with. Mm -hmm. Fast forward ahead in terms of maybe 15 years or yeah, roughly about that. When I came on board, I was teaching at a different school and they recruited me to come over and for some reason I, I was the resource teacher for the a new school they had started called the School of Law and Government and I became hmm. the resource teacher because I I could teach about law even though I wasn't <laughs> an attorney but I could I knew how to do that so they said, well, here's a guy that we think would be good to come in at School Without Walls and help us in terms of recruitment because I had recruited the kids for that school and to teach here. So I went over and it was interesting that the number of kids at School Without Walls, this was 15 years later, had declined from roughly 170 kids to mm -hmm. less than 100. Mm -hmm. And the question was, what's going on here? You know, how can mm -hmm. we... How can we get kids to be interested? So I worked with the staff in terms of developing some marketing strategies. I trained a group of kids from School Without Walls to go with me out to other nice. uh, junior high schools and talk about what we were about. And, you know, it, it worked for the most part. It took some time, you know, a couple of years to build the, uh, the right. student body up again. But they were... There, there was a good chance that they may have closed School Without Walls had right. not we had not they decided as a group that we need to do something about this. And so they devoted one of their staff positions to me doing that. Hmm. The extended class was an interesting process because it wasn't hmm. only interdisciplinary, but as I said, there was a process for developing the curriculum that was student generated as opposed mm -hmm. to top down. Now it's interesting, you know, I'm gonna be a bit transparent here because here we are, I retired in 2010 and the school 
School Without Walls has continued. It's still there and it's working for the most part, but the extended classes are now kind of more teacher driven as opposed mm, to student driven. And that's something that I'm working with them right now. I'm kind of an unpaid consultant to go in and work mm. with them. And, and that's, that's something that we are, we're going to focus on is how to get student ideas and have teachers select their idea for their extended class theme mm. based on student input and interest as opposed to, well, I think I'll do it on great American art. That sounds mm -hmm. like something I, you know, I'm interested in as a teacher. I'm sure they will be too if I can right. do it, you know. So, you know, that's that's an important piece is mm -hmm. to, in mm -hmm. terms of self-determination theory is working with that concept in terms of how do we not only select the topic, but then let's work on what are our initial qu essential questions that we want to mm. get answers to. I mean, so suppose a teacher and the kids decide that criminal justice is going to be their focus, you know, which would be a good one to deal with in the city of Rochester, given all mm. the issues with policing and right. unfair practices of the history of discrimination and racism and whatever. So in terms of those questions, what are going to be the, uh, the kinds of not only questions, but what resources can we call mm. upon from the community to use and have the students participate in that kind of brainstorming as well. Well, mm -hmm. my, my father's a cop, you know. I mean, he might be interested in coming in and talking with us. Or I, how about that district attorney that you guys used to work with? Or whatever. So, again, building ownership and right. capitalizing on student interest, I think, is, is key to that. And then even ideas for projects. You know, what, mm -hmm. what is it that we want to investigate? What, is it, what are the key issues that we want to focus on? So how do we take all that interest and generate it into projects? And again, certainly teacher participation in terms of meaningful suggestions for kids, in terms of developing support for what they're going to do, mm -hmm. but also focusing again on structure as opposed to control. Right. Yeah. And again, yeah. a key part of self-determination theory. So the extended class it was a key issue as well as the curriculum building in it. Mm -hmm. I think, of course, the, the other question is, given complete freedom from mm -hmm. high-stakes standardized testing, what are we about? What are the skills and the knowledge that we want to build within kids, have them grow and develop in, in order to become effective, responsible citizens mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. with positive well-being and, as Ryan says, to flourish in terms right. of being right. a, a real living in, uh, human being who's enjoying life and mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. doing something creative and participating in society. All those things, I think, right. were important. Right. So we generated, we actually, in terms of our assessment, because before I came, the assessment was basically teachers would write on a blank sheet of paper what mm. the kid did the, for the quarter and how the teacher thought they did, you know, hopefully mm. answering the question as demonstrated by, you know, whatever <laughs> right, it was. Right. There was a need to do that, and we did develop those things, mm -hmm. which were later refined. And here's kind of a side story, and if I, if I get too much involved in this, call me on it, Don. <laughs> but around the year 2000, mm -hmm. a new state education commissioner oh, yeah. came in at, in New York. His name mm -hmm. was uh, Richard Mills. Interesting side story to the side story is that Richard Mills had been in Vermont as their state commissioner and hmm. had implemented some real positive progressive educational reform in terms of assessment by portfolio. Oh, right. But after a couple of years, they decided it didn't work. Mm. And uh, so he went traditional on them and did high stakes <laughs> standardized testing and, and whatever was needed. And he got hired in New York by the Board of Regents there to come over mm. there and, and fix New York because we're mm -hmm. going downhill too is what it boiled down to. And his intended policy was that all schools would have to 
use the five New York State Regents exams right. as a mm. as one criteria for graduation. They had to pass that with a 65 percent passing. Of course, our the response at School Without Walls in the year 2000, while I was there, was that doesn't make any sense for us in mm-hmm. terms of where we want to go with kids, in no, okay, terms yeah. of developing critical thinking, you know, creative problem solving, learning to use the community as a resource, creating positive interpersonal relationships, uh, those kinds of things, being a great citizen and how to, mm-hmm. how to be a change agent, all of those things. That, those things are not tested for on the regent's <laughs> exams. So right, right. a house divided against itself shall not stand was the rallying cry that we had and we actively fought against it and found out that there were about uh, 30 other schools in New York State that had the same kind of concerns. Mm-hmm. They were mostly from New York City. There was one in Ithaca mm-hmm. and, uh, and us in Rochester and we got together and said, let's form a new network of schools that will actively lobby for this and mm. and we did in fact we after confronting the commissioner with the principals from all the schools in albany we met with him and he turned us down and said no nope, this is what we're going to do whatever mm. we then new york new york city schools had some good connections with high powered attorneys law firms there and we we hired pro bono a law firm to represent us. It went all the way to the New York uh, Court of Appeals. Hmm. And I was the plaintiff. I was, oh. the, <laughs> I was the token plaintiff. <laughs> and it was before they, I think, before they could make a ruling on it, the regents, Board of Regents, there's 17 of them. There were a couple who were former law uh, legislators as well. They said, let's work this out without a court decision and, mm. you know, let's come up with a compromise. So they came up with a compromise, which was, okay, the 30 ad schools don't have to do the regents except mm-hmm. the English. They have to uh-huh. do the English. We were mm-hmm. amazed that we got away with that and that they didn't <laughs> include math, you know, because yeah, math yeah. was always the, the big issue, I think, with a lot of schools and kids and whatever. Mm-hmm. So that was the compromise that we went to. and. Uh, there was a lot of work done by the consortium in terms of because we one of the the uh, agreements was as opposed to regents exams what will you use mm. to make sure that kids have a understanding of social studies of science mm. of english of math whatever incidentally the reason i mention english is that our compromise with them was that okay we'll do the ela but we're also going to do one of our own as well yeah <laughs> do a separate pbat we call them uh, mm. performance based assessments so we did that and we developed basically it was more in depth projects by individual students who had to mm. present to a committee of two teachers and an outside resource person a community professional, usually an expert in the area that they had chosen to work mm-hmm. on. And also there were a set of skills. There was rubrics that were developed mm-hmm. as a guide to assess each student. And they were really good. They they are really good in terms of uh, emphasizing critical thinking, creative problem solving, you know, being able to discern fact from opinion, mm-hmm. even empathizing with other perspectives, those kinds of things. So... Those became, those plus we had, what we had already developed became the, the driving force of mm-hmm. each class and extended class and other classes at School Without Walls, as right. well as all the other consortium schools. So that's, to get back to where we were, right. <laughs> that's kind of the history of, of how we came to discern and identify what, what we're really after in terms of kids. Right. Right. beginning to do and of course those are difficult to necessarily measure as well but we do our best in terms of having that committee of three people there right. to say well what about this you know have you thought about that what, what exactly do you think about uh, trump's version of of immigration you know that mm-hmm. kind of thing mm-hmm. versus biden's you know if that's what their project was on so, right right yeah so the skills were an important piece now to get 
into the other aspects of self-determination theory, more mm -hmm. some of the affective things that we thought were important. One of the, the key points of self-determination theory tends to be taking students' perspectives and letting right. students know that you're not necessarily judgmental, but you may ask them questions about it in order to get them to think about their issues. Or, you know, do you think, you know, even though you don't like math, do you think there's a purpose for it? Do you think uh, society needs you to be a, a reasonable mathematician in some ways? You know, those kinds of questions that we mm -hmm. think are important. As well as, you know, uh, you know, Jamal, you, you look like you're angry this morning. What's going on? You know, tell me about it. You know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we implemented at School Without Walls is that every kid, every day, has to write in their journal. Hmm. And so during extended class time, they take the time to do that. You know, and, right. you know there can be prompts like, you know, think about, you know, what is it in your... Uh, what is it at home or at school that really bothered you today or this mm. week? You know, write about that, you know, and tell us about it or whatever you want. And for mm. kids who don't like to write, draw a picture about it, you know, if, mm. if you want to and put a caption on it and whatever. So journals were important not only for kids to write and keep themselves, but the agreement was with the kid that once every two weeks you're going to turn the journal in to your advisor, the teacher of mm. that extended class. And there's a trust relationship going on here. I'm not right. going to share it with anybody unless you demonstrate that there's an issue of self-harm or harm to others. You know, mm -hmm. And that way mm -hmm. I'm obligated. I have to do it. So kids right. knew that up front. Mm -hmm. But it became what I still consider one of the most effective ways to identify trauma or potential trauma within mm. a kid's life. Mm -hmm. Because once a, kid, once a teacher had that, they could talk with the kid. Because the second part of the journal thing is that I have to meet with you now individually for at least 20 minutes once every two weeks, one-on-one. -on -one. And we talk about your journal. We talk about how things are going in the extended class, other classes, what you might need help with if I have to refer you to the counselor or social worker, or whatever, we have to do that. So mm -hmm. tremendous opportunity. So, so it sort of has that advisory, like an advisory kind of role. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the extended class was not only academic, but also advisory for social emotional issues. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and for the teachers and the class to determine at times, you know, I, I seem to detect that there's something going on here in this extended class with, I don't know, you know, you, you, all of you seem to identifying some concern about drugs. Mm. You think it would be worthwhile for for us to have a, a drug expert, a counselor, come into our mm. class and talk to us about it. Yeah, how many of you think that? You know, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's mm -hmm. do it. You know, let's make it happen, even though it's it's kind of like. In intermittent time, intermittent right, right. time within our academic focus on criminal justice, there's some relationship to it as well. So you know, right, let's right. do it, and it makes perfect sense for you guys. So, yeah. so in so, terms so of it problem like... identification, it was critical. Mm -hmm. The journals and the personal conferences. Right. Right. Sorry. Yeah. So, so it, it sounds like that there's the structuring of the of the program is not about predetermination. It's about uh, emergent, uh, just emerging out of who's in the room and, and what, what they bring. Is, would, yes. is, does that sound reasonable? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. In terms of their interest and their needs and their experiences, what is it that we can use to massage that into a learning experience for you that will mm -hmm. not only satisfy you personally in terms of self-actualization, right. but also your self-esteem. You're going to grow more. You're going to really feel good about what you're doing. Having the opportunity to present your findings to the city council, you know, those mm. types <laughs> of things, you know, extremely intrinsically motivating for kids. Some a little right. scary, but 
right, you know, right. we'll work on your presentation to the city council, you yeah. know, <laughs> and you can even have a friend come with you, you know, from class, you know, to help mm -hmm. you present, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So, yeah, yeah. so that that was critical. Now, another thing that, that was critical was that uh, staff decided, because there were so many kids concerned about social political issues mm. and trauma, that uh, and just their own personal interests that we ought to have a community service time too during hmm. the week. So for two and a half hours once a week, every Thursday afternoon, kids are, we actually did it, did it in the morning, Thursday morning, kids rather than reporting to school would report to their community service site. And they mm -hmm. had a choice in terms of who they would work with and what organization, mm -hmm. why they wanted to do it. We would get feedback, agreements with their supervisors there to give us feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, having kids out, you know, not only in terms of a focus on a career, because that could work sideways. I mean, it right, could right. be an addition <laughs> to their real career interests, but having them out there in the community actively participating and mm -hmm. in some cases even having the organization become dependent on them mm -hmm. for what they were providing to that uh, place and all and also what the organization was providing to the kid yeah was yeah. A, a crucial aspect yeah the other thing that we built into the organizational structure was decision making time Believing that kids ought to play a prominent role in terms of individual, classroom, school-wide, and community, local, neighborhood, city, mm -hmm. state, and national decision-making. Kids ought to have a time to do that so that hmm. if they decide that they want to go down and hear the Biden speak downtown or Trump speak, mm, right. you know, they ought to be able to go down and do it, you know, to uh, to learn more. If there's a problem of bullying in the school, what mm. are we going to do about this? Can we generate a proposal? Can we do some investigation in groups and find out what what would what might work in this particular environment in terms of discouraging bullying and encouraging more positive relationships mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. kinds of things uh, what are we going to do uh, another one what are we going to do about the homeless people who are coming to use mm -hmm. our picnic tables during lunchtime you know mm -hmm. is there a way mm -hmm. that we can work this out so decision making was great and in some cases if teachers wanted to call a town meeting in which mm. the whole school would get together in the gymnasium all-purpose room, we could present a problem to them and say, okay, go right. back to your extended classes now, discuss it, see if you can generate some proposals, and float a proposal around, you send reps around to each of your extended classes to vote on it and bring mm. it back. One of the things we found out that with town meetings originally back in 1971 when the school started is that all decisions for the school would be made through a town meeting. Hmm, okay. All 170 kids plus the 10 staff would get together and they'd hash it out. The problem with that was that it ended up being that the kids and teachers who could talk the loudest and the longest <laughs> ended up staying after school would end and a lot of the kids would leave and they'd end up making the decisions, you know, right, as opposed right. to the the school, you know. So that's why we turn more toward an extended class decision making as opposed mm. to town meetings, even though we completely didn't reject uh, town meetings. Right, right. So, so um, that's one of those things that that I've been finding in in almost without exception, uh, actually without exception, <laughs> uh, is that any school that's been around long enough has these kind of evolutions of their processes and and how they operate and and they discover things they discover that you know 185 people trying to make a decision together i just recently heard it that's called the babble effect is mm -hmm. that that whoever Power talks babble. the most <laughs> either gets appointed to the leadership position or ends up making the decision or whatever so that's a really important part of what I see as a, a property, a, a feature of, of the agentic schools is their ability to change and respond to 
what is discovered in terms of, you know, what works, what doesn't, how does it change given who's here. And School Without Walls is an interesting position because it is embedded in the larger mainstream system. Um, like I said, you know, you had these state level stuff coming in and then having to respond and use use those bigger decision making, bigger processes, you know, courts and lawyers and, <laughs> you know, forming a coalition with other schools in order to protect your essential nature as as a different kind of school than what the mainstream is. And so that's right. that's a really important thing to recognize and celebrate is that, you know, here's an example of a school that has taken agency not as far as some schools have, but certainly done it, taken it to a, a large degree within a bigger system that doesn't traditionally operate that way. And, right. and maintaining that, that identity and the, that essential way of, of ensuring that everybody in the school, the way you described the, the initiation of it was, okay, somebody was the charismatic leader at the beginning. But what they did as a charismatic leader was to say, who can I bring in who shares a vision, shares, an, it shares a sensibility? I don't know if they remembered that you had applied b previously, <laughs> but <laughs> if they did, they knew that, you know, okay, this is a guy who at least shares it in some way and then, and then brought you in to, to, to take a position. Um, but it also, you know, it may be that, well, you also may have had a different experience in terms of just the larger system. So, so you're saying, you know, you were brought in in a context in which, okay, we have a struggle and we need somebody who's like-minded, but we also need somebody who has a skill that addresses our need now. And so you were brought in to, to accomplish a specific you know, kind of task and did that and provided leadership through a longer process. But, but that's, I think, that's exactly what a dynamic system does. That's what a, mm -hmm. a, a you know, agency has to be both individual and collective. And it can look very different ways. And this is one of the things I challenge the, the democratic schools. I mean, you know, they're an extreme. They tend to be private because of how they really do operate democratically. I mean, some of them literally have children making, you know, hiring and firing decisions and budget, budget decisions and the whole thing. So, so it's interesting to say, okay, well, you don't have those same opportunities but you also have different opportunities because you know you can you started a school with 175 kids that's really impressive that's not something that happens in these other forms in fact most schools mm -hmm. aren't even that big and that's right. and i bet you're considered a small school <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean yeah. yeah so so i think it's really important to recognize that that the underlying way that we know it's working is based on self determination theory mm -hmm. is that we we can we can be confident that even though you your school without walls looks so different and is embedded in a very different context but we can be confident that it's still accomplishing the same task the same fundamental task and that is supporting students to learn as deeply as possible because we have this framework for looking at it and looking at it in a way that is specific to human nature but also not specific to the cultural, administrative, legal structures within which your school is operating. Yeah. It's human, not organizational. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting it, way to put it, you know. It, it is, and it, it, it raises a number of questions. Just point of clarification is that School Without Walls is now about 250 kids. Oh, nice, and they nice. they expanded the building. We, it, we've actually moved about five times, I think, in the past 50-odd years. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's 250 kids now. And it, it's also interesting that the, uh, uh, the characteristics of the kids have changed dramatically. Mm. Initially, it was pretty much, of the 175, it was probably maybe... 85% white middle class kids. Mm. Now it's probably at least 90% black and Hispanic mm. kids who are there. So it, it's an interesting issue in terms of curriculum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. social emotional needs, right. uh, given the socioeconomic status of so many of the kids who are living in poverty and experiencing trauma.
you know, the, the dealings with those things in terms of the integration of those aspects into curriculum and opportunities and also building structure. It's interesting that initially when School Without Walls started, you know, there was, it was an open lunch for, mm. at, from 12 to 1 o'clock. Kids could go out and go to the local restaurants or whatever, or they could bring their lunch if they wanted mm -hmm. to. We didn't have a cafeteria, so mm. kids just, you know, brought their lunch for the most part. Essentially, what happened, given the transition of the, the socioeconomic status of kids who came to school without walls, they built in a cafeteria for mm -hmm. the kids to meet their needs. And, you know, some of the alumni are saying, oh, you guys are getting more traditional now or whatever. <laughs> right, right. Physical education was done in the community. You'd either go to the Y, you know, mm -hmm. after school, before school, during school, if you had a free period or whatever, and work out and have somebody write something up that, yeah, so-and-so was here and did this, you know, for an hour today or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More poverty-stricken parents were concerned about their kids going out into the community. So yeah, yeah. we built a gym and mm -hmm. hired a gym teacher, you know? So th there's changes that took place because of societal needs as well as exactly. Uh, exactly. individual needs. So that's kind of interesting. The other issue that you mentioned that I thought was interesting was the whole concept of leadership and the difficulty in terms of self-determination theory research, especially mm -hmm. being accepted by right. leadership and say, and more school and school district leaders saying, wow, oh, this makes sense. We've never thought of organizing schools through this lens. Mm -hmm. And it makes so much sense to do that. Why hasn't that been able to happen? Becomes one critical question for right. uh, self-determination theory experts like Rich Ryan and John Marshall and all those guys and ladies out there who are focusing on it. You know, how do we do this? How do we get this into, how do we change the mindsets of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the policy makers to see the importance of this in terms of student growth and development? Right, right. And the other thing that you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting in terms of the dynamics of of control, mm -hmm. and I know Ryan and DC talked a great deal about this in terms of high stakes testing right. and other financial controls, class size, scheduling, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. How how controlling that is, and how it limits the creativity and the the meeting of psychological needs of kids. Right. So, you know, it, it's, we're still having a good fight in terms of, yeah. <laughs> I think, us progressive educators trying to convince people who are kind of more from authoritarian versus democratic perspectives mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on the value of that for schools and for kids especially. Right, and it, right. it, it's interesting we have a community board at the School Without Walls now that I'm on, despite being retired, they've recruited <laughs> me in there, you know, to help them kind of, because they've gone backwards a, a, a good deal in terms mm. of, they've retrenched, I think, in terms of some of the traditional authoritarian aspects mm. of schools. So I'm working with them on that, but the question came up the other day in community board, what are we going to do about the issue of Trump versus Biden and all the sub issues that are connected with that that may mm. have an impact on our kids? Because we have right. immigrant kids here. Right. We have kids whose parents may not be able to vote because of the voting restrictive restriction mm. laws. We have all kinds of things that are going on if Trump were to become victorious and whether or not that's an aspect of authoritarianism versus democratic thought and mm -hmm. and uh, an implementation mm 
So how do we deal with that, especially if teachers are concerned that it may cause too much disruption in the classroom right. or whatever? kind of reminds me of the old Tinker versus Des Moines Supreme Court case in terms of whether or not kids ought to be allowed to wear armbands and right. talk about anti-Vietnam issues, mm -hmm. in which the school said, basically, you know, the Constitution does not stop at the schoolhouse door. Right. You know, there right. should be... Famously, yeah availability of kids and unless there's you know specific indications that there's going to be violence no you can't stop it because it might be but so anyway that right, issue right. of authoritarianism versus democratic behavior i think is not only reflected i think with this within this election but it also becomes more prominent in terms of well let's look at ourselves you know right. john dewey right. said you know it's not preparing kids for society and for democracy, schools are democ democratic That's institutions. Right. Right. So let's, let's deal with that stuff right here in terms right. of how democratic are we versus authoritarian. Right, so, right. Yeah, yeah, and that, kind no, of that's interesting sidelight. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's, that's one of those central issues th that, that kind of spans <laughs> all the way from the schoolhouse to the statehouse. The default in our society seems to be more authoritarian and, and there's a principle actually that, that called subsidiarity that is the opposite. Subsidiarity means that decisions should be made at the lowest possible level in an organization. And so it, it actually came out of Catholicism. But it's, it's a principle that, you know, really like the, uh, I was just reading yesterday about how Jonathan Haidt, psychologist, um, I forget where, but... Um, he and, and a guy named uh, Lukanievich, or Lu, Lukanioff, um, wrote a book, Coddling the American Mind, I think it's called. Mm. And, uh, and they were talking about how a lot of what goes on in social media is exactly the opposite of what you would learn in therapy as positive ways of dealing with things mentally. So, so it tends towards catastrophic thinking, like worst first thinking is another way of saying it. Um, or, or black and white thinking, is there's no gray. And a healthy human mind tries to mitigate against those ways of thinking because they tend towards ill health, mental, mental ill health rather than well-being. Mm -hmm. And so part of what, what a controlling system does is it tends to kind of create this default to distrust and and control which we know from self-generation theory is exactly the opposite of what of what is actually conducive to human well-being so subsidiarity is an organizational principle that i think is is i, I think it's important to have a word for it <laughs> uh, because it's a lot easier to point to it and say well we should be thinking about subsidiarity how you uh, achieve subsidiarity actually changes the depending on their context. So a small school of 50 kids and, and, and four or five adults is going to necessarily look different than a school of 250 kids and, and what probably a, a dozen or so adults um, is necessarily it and, and being embedded, being a private school with its own little board where the kids actually serve as the board <laughs> versus, you know, having a, a bureaucratic being embedded in a larger bureaucratic organization that actually has, you know, lines of authority and and decision making and re, re, uh, answers to a legislature, that that has n the kids have only theoretical access to, <laughs> uh, practical access might be different. Is is you have to recognize that those are different things, and so it's a, an ongoing question: is what does it look like for us to, yeah. you know to push decisions as low as we can go. And in some cases, you know, when you have 250 kids, some of those decisions are happening at a teacher level, not at a student level. Now, one of the ethics, it sounds like, one of the kind of principles in the community is, is we need to, you know, give the kids the opportunity to chime in on, on the major decisions. Is that the teachers aren't just gonna impose. They're gonna, is there's a, an, a deliberate mitigation of the tendency to control, as opposed to just defaulting to it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's another thing that I think, I was just making notes this morning as I was waking up, 
is that that's a property I think of of the agentic schools is that that there has to be a mechanism to undermine the tendency towards control is it has mm. to be explicit and it has to be deliberate um, and it sounds like the way you've described it is that that that's an active part of how schools school without walls actually works well how we're trying to move back in that direction and right, uh, right. it's going it, to it's a real challenge it's it's very interesting in terms of the work that we're uh, myself and a couple of alumni teachers are uh, are doing and we're involving other people as well but mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. the, the couple of the things that you mentioned in terms of having a larger school and trying to be as democratic as possible is that I used to, t in terms of relationships and learning from one another in terms of the consortium schools, the 30-odd schools that exist now, our closest school that works like School Without Walls is the Ithaca Alternative School. I think mm. it's called the Layman Alternative, our Layman Community School. And so I hire a bus and we take about mm. 50 kids down to Ithaca to spend the day with their school. Nice. And we noticed that at their town meeting that they had maybe 250 kids, you know, in the room, and it worked very well. Hmm, and interesting. The, we came back, and the kids would all say, you know, not all of them, but some of them would say, "Hey, how, how come we don't do that? How come we just hear the problem in mm. the town meeting, and then we go back to our extended classes to have more in-depth discussions about it?" And I said, "Well, think about that." I said. Think about who was in that room and what what were they like for the most part. A, they were all white. Mm. B, if you could do a little investigation, they were all middle class for the most part. So they had pretty much all the same values. School Without Walls, you've got the Islamic group. You've got the, the black hip hoppers. You've got the kids who want to be here, who are of color, but they're really struggling. Mm -hmm. You got the white liberals, you got the skateboarders, you got the uh, LBGQT uh, group, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a lot of different groups that are struggling for power and recognition and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's important that they all have some airtime and uh, right. ability to participate. So, you know, our method, you know, it's certainly not like uh, in a uh, New England town meeting, but right. uh, or <laughs> what happens in Ithaca, but it's the best, you know, do you, can you think, I think we pose the question, what are the advantages to doing it our way? You mm -hmm. know, and they say, oh, okay. So that was right, a right. way of taking the student perspective, but again, kind of building in a structure versus control. Exactly, over it. exactly. Yeah, so it, it, it was happening, uh, even though we didn't call it self-determination theory. Right, well, that, that's the thing, is that the hard thing about organizations is that, most people individually do not recognize the nature of an organization mm -hmm. is they have a perspective that they embody and it's not inherent to not inherently easy to see how the situation you're in is actually determinative of of how your mind is actually working so so you the example there is actually really good is there's there's two very similar groups in the sense of they are schools <laughs> they have about 250 people and you know there's some f surface features that are very similar but then when you take and it probably doesn't take long <laughs> to look a little closer and say oh this group is probably you know in a cultural sense highly similar and this group is highly differentiated in, in, in a cultural sense. Right. And so that one feature, being homogenous uh, or not, <laughs> um, changes everything. <laughs> right. And, and so the response to that is, is different. It's, it's, they're, they're facing similar issues in terms of we've got a large, you know, 250 people is actually a lot of people, and we've got to make decisions. And then how do we do that? Well, in one case we do it one way, in the case we do it another. But the underlying critical feature is that what matters is that voices are heard. 
and that and that that individuals feel that their their expressions their contributions are heard right so it's both it's both receiving and giving <laughs> uh, yeah. that this is where the the agentic engagement is a crucial insight that that Reeve introduced into self generation theory in 2011 is to say it's not just the it, it's not just a internal process it is a social process and that was the crucial right. insight that agentic engagement brings is to say agency is not a consequence of individual personal thought and interactive thoughts it is something that goes out into an environment and gets a response and and if if that environment is welcoming of agency in other words the individual expressing agency then then that becomes a self-fulfilling kind of process is it it's it's positive reinforcement for acting in the environment and you just came up with a different way of doing it than Ithaca did you know right. in Rochester it occurs one way because we know that my speculation would be that group dynamics at 250 is very different <laughs> Not speculation, actually. Pretty confident knowledge uh, that 25 people is a lot different than 250. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the, the dynamic is going to be different, and the listening is going to be different, and and it doesn't not it's not 250 that's the crucial thing. It's the diversity. You can you can have a lot less, a lot more homogeneous sense of values and sense of contribution and sense of of personal relationship with 25 people is different, truly different than than 250 people. Right. And it, so it comes back to a psychological pattern is that mm -hmm. I can relate to 25 people, I cannot relate to 250 unless there's certain other things in alignment. Right. You know, and, and so it's more complicated. to make it happen. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, so what you've found, you, you've overcome a harder problem <laughs> and, and you found ways to do it though. And and you've done it over a long term. That's the that's the magic and beauty of it, is that that you found solutions, and then you changed your solutions over time. Um, you had the opportunity to add a cafeteria, to add a gym, to add staff that that were going to support support the whole person that you're serving. So being able to change and shift and and to see continuity through. A, a complete change of demographics is actually really amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, not every not every school, even traditional schools, uh, do mm -hmm. well in that in that process. But I think that's also where setting up more democratic processes gives you more resilience. I mean, you know, it's interesting what you're saying, and it, it makes me think of current issues now at School Without Walls. One of the biggest problems right now comes from the city school district or organizational mm. mandates on the school in terms of how staff is selected ah, uh, yes. to be there. Now there's a transfer process, but it's not always, it doesn't always work to the extent that, we, that people would like it to work, especially at School Without Walls, because Given all the variables that I described of School Without Walls, you have to have people who support that. Right. Uh, or are willing to work with it and maybe, you know, modify, propose change, you know, be a change agent within this progressive place as well. But right now, having people be a, being assigned to School Without Walls adds more difficulty in terms of how do you get these people, you know, to buy into this, you know, through... Yeah be nice if they just read the research by Ryan in DC and said, <laughs> Oh, I get it. You know, <laughs> right, I know right. what they're trying to do. I can, I think I can do that too. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so far in terms of that, it's going to take a little bit more in terms of, of dealing with that issue. And it may have to yeah. be from the bigger organization in terms of saying, you know, in terms of having staff at this school who fit, they're going to need some special flexibility in terms mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. searching for those candidates, recruiting them, and being able to take them into the right. organiz into right. that organization. So, another issue, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, another issue to deal with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I'll, so I'll just mention that that one of the things that I've put together is a 
thing called a deeper learning resolution, which is aimed at sort of how do we help people understand the crucial role that that primary needs play in how humans function. Ah. Um, so it's a way to more formally recognize that and, and put it into policy so that you can start, you know, aiming in that direction and, and, and it, it, it as a resolution it's, it is not itself a binding thing but it lays the groundwork for okay how do we you know make staffing decisions or or, or cultivate mm -hmm. staff that have appropriate attitudes and, and recognize as a whole organization that this is a foundational piece it's it's not optional it's it's how humans are <laughs> and so yeah. so that I'll also I'll, I'll uh, Send that a lot, you know. Send you a link. If you and, would, and, I would and, really appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So. Well, this has been delightful, Don. Yes. And, yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, you know, if you need me to clarify anything at any time, I'm available. Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time as well. Um, so uh, we'll we'll call it good there. Thanks for 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 uh, telling stories. I, I, you know, it's a really fascinating. Uh, context oh, that you're my in. God. So. You know, there's many more, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. It was fun. This has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think? about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis. Agentic schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.